Alors aujourd'hui, euh, encore une fois, je vous rappelle qu'on va faire un panel qui va, euh, qui va jouer, qui va louvoyer entre le français et l'anglais à plusieurs reprises. Uh, we will be moving between French and English throughout this panel. Alors, pour ceux qui ont besoin de traduction, je vous encourage fortement à aller chercher vos oreillettes de traduction. Uh, we will be moving back and forth between French and English most likely during this panel. I strongly encourage you, if you need so, to have your translation devices at hand. You'll be putting them on and off many times. Vous allez devoir les, les remettre et les enlever à plusieurs reprises, je crois. Donc, le panel « Nos écosystèmes en évolution ». Notre écosystème semble en mouvance de la création à la programmation, de la critique au public et des agents créatifs identifiant de nouvelles approches pour mieux faire circuler leurs artistes. Il y a comme un requestionnement ou une redéfinition de chacune des parties de notre chaîne, de notre milieu. Quelles sont nos zones communes? Comment repenser la chaîne? Recréer les liens qui font du sens dans notre environnement. De la création vers de nouveaux publics, des professionnels pensent à leur rôle dans un ensemble écologique et dans un monde en mouvement. On le sait, les changements se produisent très rapidement, très fréquemment. On est dans une nouvelle ère, alors comment est-ce qu'on réagit, comment est-ce qu'on reste réactif dans ces nouvelles réalités? Je vais commencer en me présentant euh, Kwekwe Aweti. Ashkenonia, yes, Wendat Endi Yanyonia, Iwahi, Tiokutin, Charles Bender Yatsi, Tiodjaki Indare. Alors, je vois des, un regard curieux juste ici en avant. Je suis Wendat, je suis de la nation Wendat, une nation autochtone du Canada qui est établie tout près de la ville de Québec. Et je viens de me présenter dans cette langue euh, de mes ancêtres. Alors, juste pour un, un petit rappel sur les efforts qui sont faits en ce moment sur le réveil des langues autochtones ici au Canada et, je l'espère, un peu partout à travers le monde. Euh, J'en profite pour présenter maintenant les autres panélistes qu'on a en nous. Et là, signe aux interprètes, c'est là que je risque de passer du français à l'anglais assez allègrement. Alors, euh, comme première panéliste ici au bout, on a Françoise de Georges, qui est productrice à Radio-Canada. Merci d'être ici. Euh, oui, de Radio France. J'ai encore fait l'erreur. C'est très gentil, Charles. C'est drôle, hein? Oui, c'est très gentil, Charles, parce que peut-être vous venir travailler à Radio-Canada avec plaisir. Hein? Ah, mais mon Dieu, vous seriez tellement, tellement invité parce que vous êtes productrice à Radio France depuis déjà au-dessus de 20 ans, si je ne me trompe pas. Oui, depuis plus de 25 ans, je, je suis productrice à, donc, à cette, dans cette radio, dans cette maison ronde qui se situe à Paris en face de la scène. Et euh, j'organise des concerts, j'enregistre des musiques euh, savantes et populaires, des des cultures des peuples du monde, justement. Et je travaille pour mon émission qui s'appelle Okora Couleur du Monde et donc pour la collection patrimoniale discographique de Radio France qui s'appelle Okora. Merci. Et on y reviendra parce que c'est très intéressant. C'est un parcours qui est très, très riche. Et je pense que vous avez beaucoup de pistes de conversation à nous proposer. Euh, je vais vous présenter aussi Martine Denevald, qui est co-directrice artistique du Festival Transamérique. Uh, au bout ici, at the end here, we have Alicia Adams, who's vice president international programming at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and Dance. Et enfin, Sassipin Siriwanidj. Artistic Director for the Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting. Bienvenue, welcome, thank you for being with us. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I'll start off at the end here with uh, Alicia. Alicia, uh, we're talking about redefining our ecosystem, redefining our roles within this ecosystem. What are your thoughts on the matter? I, I think that, <clears throat> sorry, good morning everybody it's so great to see so many people in the audience um, who are friends and who have been uh, my peers for for years i think that we're having this conversation because of COVID and what that has done to the ecosystem and i think that um trying to at this point to to, to restart to re-engage um has been very important but during the COVID, and there's there's no post COVID, i COVID time i think Um, we felt isolated and needed to engage. And so I think that there were many convenings 
of various types to join people to, together to discuss ways of going, of going forward. What is it going to mean or what was it going to mean for us to continue to do the work that we, that we do? And for those of us in the international arena, it was particularly dire as um, so, so many uh, organizations, so many countries, uh, so many places just turned inward and only wanted to focus on, on the, the, the local um, or, or the regional. And, and that's, that's understandable. But I think that um, the international, the cultural exchange, cultural diplomacy, all of that continu continues to be very, very important to the, the work that we do. It continues to be very, very important for us to bring people to, together to increase understanding around the world. We certainly are in a very difficult position um, in the world at this, this moment. And I think that the arts are what we have as the strongest tool to lift up um, people, to lift up society, and to have people think about um, everything in a, in, a, in, a different, in a different way. So I've participated in, in many of, the, of those uh, convenings over the, you know, over the past, three, past three years. Thank you. Uh, France de Georges. Je vais, <rire> je vais vous laisser le temps. De... Vous êtes encore en train d'écouter la réponse, ça ne sera pas long. Non, non, bon. Ah oui, OK, parfait. Ah OK, vous réfléchissiez, c'est bon. Je pensais qu'on était encore en train d'écouter la réponse de, de, de Mme... <rire> je vous lance, je vous, je vous passe la parole à ce moment-ci. Surtout comme vous travaillez en radio, l'impact de la COVID a été complètement différent. Euh, comment est-ce que vous voyez les changements dans l'écosystème? Vous étiez au cœur de ça jusqu'à un certain point. Vous étiez encore très active au moment où ça se passait, de par le fait que vous étiez encore euh, une voix qui portait et qui se rendait chez les gens malgré l'isolement euh, à ce moment-là. Alors, il y a plusieurs choses. Euh... C'est vrai qu'il y a cette COVID qui a changé, les, changé la donne, mais, mais le problème de l'écosystème de la, de la, de a, a commencé bien avant. J'ai essayé de voir d'ailleurs à peu près à quel moment cette période avait débuté, euh, cette période où vraiment l'écosystème a été, euh, a commencé, enfin disons la, la, la dégradation de l'écosystème a commencé à devenir presque irrémédiable. Quoi. Et, et en fait, je me suis aperçue que les chercheurs avaient remonté ça en 1945 avec les 2000 explosions nucléaires qui avaient suivi et qui avaient vraiment abîmer cette biosphère. Et je me suis dit que c'est à partir de ce moment-là, finalement, qu'en 50 ans, euh, c'est aussi le rapport d'experts de, 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 aux, aux Nations Unies qui a, qui a conclu ceci, c'est qu'en 50 ans de son histoire, la, la dégradation a été tellement importante, plus importante que dans toute l'histoire de l'humanité, sur ces 50 dernières années. Donc, ce n'est pas uniquement la COVID. La COVID est un des effets de cette dégradation, mais ce n'est pas vraiment la COVID. C'est vrai qu'en termes de radio, moi, ça ne m'a pas empêché d'aller voir les gens c'est un peu mon travail d'ailleurs d'aller sur, sur le terrain, d'aller à la rencontre de ces communautés euh, autochtones, souvent, souvent isolées, puisque c'est aussi euh, l'objet de cette collection discographique patrimoniale, qui est quand même une collection historique remarquable de Radio France, puisque les enregistrements remontent jusqu'en 1950. Et euh, donc, je n'ai pas senti la pandémie de la même façon. En plus, je dirais quand même, que pour ne pas être complètement négatif, que ces, ces concerts que j'ai pu maintenir pour certains, euh, on fait toujours salle pleine. Et que malgré la pandémie, même au moment les plus difficiles, alors on n'a pas pu faire des concerts tout le temps, évidemment, mais en fait, le lien avec le public ne s'est pas arrêté pour moi. J'ai continué à avoir des contacts avec, avec les, les auditeurs. Et, et donc, ça, c'est une chose que je n'ai pas vécue de façon, disons, d'une très, très violente. Après, je dirais que ces musiques de tradition orale, ces musiques traditionnelles sont vraiment liées à la nature, à la biodiversité, à la biosphère, à l'écosystème, et justement, et que donc la préservation de la diversité de ces cultures va, irrémi... enfin, va, va de fait avec la préservation de la, de la biodiversité, de la, de la biosphère. Et donc, en fait, ces musiques qui, qui ponctuent la vie des gens, qui sont des, des, des musiques souvent de fonction, euh, qui accompagnent les grands moments de la vie quotidienne des gens, eh bien, ces musiques, elles sont vraiment euh, liées à la nature. Et donc, en fait, euh, je, je, je suis restée quand même optimiste, malgré le constat 
disons, des chèques <rire> général, je reste optimiste sur la relation à l'autre, sur l'altérité et sur la manière de faire vivre tout ça. Il y a beaucoup de peuples autochtones, vous le savez bien, Charles, mais, mais aussi beaucoup d'autres peuples qui conservent ce, cette relation à la nature très fortement. Et donc, ce lien musique, culture, nature, il est essentiel et il est très significatif. Et je pense qu'une rencontre comme la nôtre aujourd'hui, elle est vraiment source d'enseignement. De, de, C'est une chose qui est le rapport entre justement ces musiques et, et, la, et la nature. Oui. Je trouve ça absolument essentiel comme perspective. Puis vous, vous abordez aussi l'essentiel, l'élément essentiel qui est l'écologie. On va y revenir un petit peu plus tard parce que forcément, euh, le milieu dans lequel on évolue est un milieu qui a un impact indéniable euh, sur, sur notre écologie. Euh, donc, on va sûrement y revenir. J'aime beaucoup le, le, la perspective que vous avez prise comme quoi il y avait déjà un, un changement, un, une transformation de notre écosystème culturel, de notre écosystème de, dans la chaîne de travail à l'intérieur de, euh, de notre milieu culturel. Il y avait déjà des changements profonds qui étaient en train de s'établir. Il y avait Clotilde, euh, la directrice du, euh, de la Place des Arts hier, qui mentionnait qu'elle avait l'impression qu'on avait vécu un âge d'or bien avant la pandémie et que déjà on sentait qu'il y avait une renaissance qui était en train de se faire. Donc, il y avait une déconstruction pour aller vers une renaissance. And I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on the matter, uh, Sassipin. Um, and yeah, I know that you, you focus a lot on how to create a relationship with uh, different communities around you, around the, uh, the festival. How do you believe that your, uh, your way of working has changed, either before or pre-pandemic? We use it as, as a sort of goalpost, but the pandemic is just something it, that the, what we do, what we work, how we work has started to change before that. How, how is that uh, change taking place? How, how do you live through that change? Yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, it's, it's good that you mentioned that that pandemic is, is sh like just one of the landmarks, really, and it's not the only uh, super important landmarks, especially in, in the realm of my work, because I will explain a little bit why that is the case. Um, I prepared a little kind of thoughts that I wrote out because I think Uh, before I dive into the current, um, what is it, situation of how we work in BIPAM in Bangkok, it's probably good to give a picture of what it's like to, to do any arts in, in Bangkok and in Thailand, because I'm sure you've probably heard of Thailand. You might not really know how, how the art is going or what the artists and the art um, practitioners are doing. So, um, yeah, so to draw that picture, um, first of all, the arts are not in any way structurally structurally included in the government's breadth of work, apart from just some traditional art form, forms, which at some point, you know, have been heralded as like national arts and who knows who said they are national arts and the ones that are not. And the performing artists themselves, they have been self-funding and self-producing with most meaningful support coming from international organizations in the country and the contemporary performing arts scene may be said to have begun around the 60s, so we're not with like centuries long history here. Yet we have a very thriving scene of performing arts, starting from, you know, firstly we had a really simple ecosystem of just artist audience. And then slowly, slowly it began to develop into artist venue audience. And then you have artist producer venue audience. And then in the end, at the moment we have Uh, more multiple elements like artist, producer, venue, audience, critics, festival platforms, for example. And of course, we have each element dropping in and out, you know, as time goes by within the ecosystem for different reasons through time. And pandemic is just another cause that, you know, um, contributes to this, this dynamic. And um, even though I wear many hats back home in Bangkok, today I will speak from the angle of the producer and um, artistic director of BIPAM. And in a way, the roles of a platform and that of a producer are closely related in Thailand since platforms and festivals require the work of a producer in order to realize themselves, I mean, the, the platforms. So, you know, you have this blurry ball of managerial, administrative, and coordinative work in the middle that nobody knew what it was or know who has to take care of this blurry thing. And so in the end, it has slowly taken shape and we found that the missing key point that we didn't quite understand for many years is this work of you know producing and uh, managers and administrators. 
So it might have sound naive, but it really took some time for us to be to to understand this that we needed more than just artists and audience to make a strong and sustainable community. So when BIPAM started, we wanted to be a platform of exchange for local and regional artists. We wanted to help people to connect to each other to help artists see that networking doesn't have to be the dirty word everybody's trying to avoid. <laughs> networking, you know, especially if you're an artist in the in in the country. We also want to recognize um, those other creative people in the ecosystem that made a production possible. You know, we many times talk about the artists, what about the designers, the translator, the dramaturg, the producer, you know, just a few examples, the stage managers, of course. And I would like to mention here that BIPAM is not the only such collective in Thailand. Um, we are. We have other fewer collectives, uh, other fellow collectives with similar missions, and I would just throw out names now because I'm very fond of their works. We have the Thai, the Thai Theater Foundation, Brayun for Arts, um, producer of Thai Performing Arts Network or Pot Pan. We have the Bangkok International Children's Theater Festival and the Bangkok Theater Festival, which is now happening in back in back home in November this year. So BIPAM has been in operation for five years. We're post-pandemic, have things changed? Yes, but not perhaps not in the direction that you might be thinking. Of course, the global health crisis, you know, hurled us all downhill. And But then the, the really interesting in thing is that it helped to release Thailand's long pacified dissidents, and especially by the youth in the country. So we have this rising movements of the youth starting in 2020, very strong. And even though most of the on-ground activism now has transformed in order to alleviate some violent confrontations with the government and the officials, Thailand as a country now is living the result of this renewed energy by the youth. And even though we're still under the same military regime for now eight years, unbelievable, and unjust arrests and threats are a daily happening, um, our society is now actively looking to engage in discussion and the power of question that the young generation has brought to us has, I would say, infected the country, whether, whether you like it or not. And this is taking shape in the arts as well. So at the moment, by Pam or myself, we see ourselves now as connectors, but not only just between people and networks, but also connectors of resources. So it's no longer enough to just have festival. Now we want to know how what we're doing can go on until the next generation of artists. And we are also connectors of generations. We are aware of the capability to raise awareness or an issue and introduce new concepts to the community. However, as we steer forward with this you know, feisty energy questioning of the youth, how do we look and see also whether we're leaving anyone behind? Are the more established artists interested in taking this ride with us and asking these new questions? What are the questions they want to ask? Can we take this leap forward without stretching the generational gap too much further? And um, on top of it all, we are also connectors between the arts and the public. So it's interesting to observe that the performing arts, at least um, in Bangkok, has been successfully receiving audiences back in the theaters. So in fact, in Thailand, I would say there's hardly been any pending period where people felt hesitant to attend a performance at all. I think the key here in Thailand seems to be how well a production can communicate to its audience, what kind of discussion is inviting them to engage in. And the clearer that is, the better. And even non-theaters would be there with you. So in Thailand now, more than art, people are so hungry for dialogue. So it's more important now than ever that producers and platforms help artists to identify the right community to connect their work with and to not only rely on the usual art goers. So I think this summarizes the, the current ongoings of, the, of what I think of when, when we talk about performing arts ecosystem at the moment, and I'll, I'll leave this here for now. Absolutely, yeah, and you you. Uh, you raise an uh, an interesting point that I I know that France had uh, raised as well, uh, not in this presentation, but in in conversations we had before about how do we uh, how do we pass it on, how do we pass our knowledge on, and our ways of working on, and how do we define ourselves at this. 
uh, this moment of change and how do we make sure it's going to be supple enough, it's going to be uh, coherent and supple enough to make sure that the next generation is going to be able to fit in and bring in their own values. There are a lot of changes from that perspective as well. So how do we carry on the knowledge that we have while at the same time being supple enough to make sure that it's, it's going to fit the, the, the wishes of a generation that's coming up? Uh, Martine, uh, tu as eu vous avez eu l'occasion d'être... De, de, on, on va... Oui, oui. <rire> c'est plus difficile en français. Il y a toujours le, le vous mail le tutoiement qui est possible. À Radio-Canada, c'est un, un enjeu qui est constant. Euh... Euh, Martine, tu as eu l'occasion de diriger plusieurs différents festivals dans, du, dans plusieurs différents contextes. Donc, ça veut dire des contextes culturels, autant artistiques que euh, sociaux, euh, différents. De quelle manière est-ce que les changements euh, dans, dans la manière d'aborder les arts, dans, dans la manière de, de comprendre la chaîne euh, de, de, des différents intervenants dans le milieu des arts peut changer à différentes vitesses ou de manière différente d'un contexte culturel à l'autre. Je, je le propose comme ça, évidemment, tu peux aller dans la direction que tu veux, euh, mais je pense que c'est une question qui est intéressante à soulever. Merci Charles, et merci d'ailleurs Sinar aussi pour l'invitation. Um, I had considered doing this in French for political reasons, reasons that belong to the politics of Québec and this particular place that we're in. And I've decided at the very last minute that it, no, it would be better to do this in English so m most people um, will understand directly what I say and you don't have to rely on translation. Um, before, before I answer your question, can I give Francoise a book recommendation? Yes. Um, I like to do book recommendations. It's interesting that you say the ecosystem as a whole starts its degradation with nuclear testing and the nuclear bomb. And I'm sure everybody's aware that nuclear testing went on for decades and decades in many different places. The Brits in Central Australia, the French in Algeria, uh, the United States in the Pacific, etc. There is a novel from 1977 by Pueblo Laguna author Leslie, um, Leslie Marmon Silco. And it's set in an indigenous community close to Los Alamos, where nuclear testing for the atomic bomb um, was carried through. Um, it's called Ceremony, and, and it, it really deals with what the author and the protagonist thinks is a, it's a real paradigm shift um, when nuclear testing starts to happen, both in its impact on the ecosystem and in its impact on how we see the world and how dominance is structured within the world. And I also mention it because it will tie in with what I'll say later, <laughs> but it's also a great novel, Ceremony. So... What we've been talking about, or what you suggested that I talk about, the, the sort of the intersection of the climate crisis and coloniality, the colonial state of the world, is really what I'm most interested in, because I think that the challenges we're facing have been with us for a very long time, in fact, and we've been in denial also of lots of them for a long time, and they will continue to accompany us for a very long time. And bringing artists and artistic work from one place to another, which is the essence of what I do, um, is really located exactly at that intersection. Um, and just to give you uh, just 10 seconds of context, so I'm a white European person and I moved to Georgiage slash Montreal a year and a half ago, and I've worked in different European countries. I've directed a festival in Germany for six years. I've spent five years at Salzburger Festspiele, one of the largest performing arts festivals in Europe. And I started as a volunteer at the London International Festival of Theatre, just you know, to say that that's, um, that's where I come from. And so over those like 18 years of, of practice, of curatorial practice, um, what's been so obvious is that the colonial matrix that has shaped the Western world's view of the world, place in the world, dominance, relationship to the rest of the world is really part of our working practices. It's not located outside of it. Um, and it's still so much present in any collaboration we set up today, transnational or even local with different communities. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just give you an idea of the questions that I have because it's more questions than answers really, but how do we deal with these asymmetrical relationships, say between an artist from the global south and a white-led arts institution in the global north? Uh, do we need to hold on to distinctions such as art, folklore, tradition, modernity, which are essential parts of the colonial project? Um, how do we organize an international festival without resorting to ethnographic or extractivist methods? Um, 
why, why do we say we want the most diverse audience possible and then we expect them to ha behave like the white upper middle class? Um, and also because you were speaking about the, the resurgence of um, indigenous languages, for example. So how, how do we support that? How do we make sure that those that still exist continue existing? Um, how, can, how, can we, how can we as white people be part of that? Um, and then because we're p talking about the ecosystem, I would also like to mention that let's consider for a moment that the ecosystem is not a metaphor. There is not something called nature outside of us and that's the ecosystem, you know, and things depend on each other and help each other. <laughs> and we're outside of that with our arts organizations and our philosophies and our ways of thinking. We are, you know, literally part of the ecosystem. We produce stuff and we consume stuff and we are part of these exchanges. Um, and, you know, that's where our practices tie into the climate crisis, obviously, and we're going to speak about it later. Um, but what I'm trying to get to is that if you think about, because at some point in history, like white men decided that they were going to rule over the rest of humanity and over the rest of nature, the rest of resources, they were there for them to use. Um, that's what, there's a Caribbean thinker, another book recommendation, <laughs> there's a Caribbean author called Malcolm Ferdinand, who wrote a book called a Decolonial Ecology. Highly recommended. It's uh, it was written in French. It's been translated since, where he speaks about the double fracture that that happened, the ecological or environmental fracture and the colonial fracture. Um, and if you take that seriously, it means that any work practice that you have as a festival, in order to be more ecologically sustainable, needs to be decolonial. And any practice you have as an international festival to work in decolonial ways needs to be ecologically sustainable. Obviously, this is a very difficult thing to do and I have no ready answers for it, but to be specific and, and sort of ambitious about it, you need to think those two things together. Um, so that's what we can sort of try to examine. <laughs> I, I cannot agree more. I do think it's a very, very, uh, very rich uh, field, a very re uh, rich uh, uh, subject to unpack. There are so many things to unpack there. And I'd really love to hear your thoughts. We'll, we'll start off with uh, uh, how do we address our ecological impact as international festival programmers or tour facilitators? I'll go with that. We'll start with the ecology, with the, the environment that we live in and that we have to uh, understand and accept. And then I really like the fact that you're pointing out the, uh, the idea of how do we rethink our colonial perspectives on this impact? How can we better interact with this environment? I'm glad it was brought on the floor, and I'm really, I'm really hoping we can go, uh, we can go in that direction. And I'll bring, uh, I'll bring up something that Cindy Huang mentioned yesterday, which was very interesting uh, towards that. Uh, alors, France, je ne sais pas si vous avez, si vous avez pu uh, bien comprendre la question, uh, mais je vous inviterai à voir si vous avez des réflexions à faire sur le sujet. How do we, how do we better interact with our ecology, with with the environment, as programmers and tour facilitators? Everyone. <laughs> I, I can respond. I was going to go last because I think um, I've been, it's, it's always giving me a bit of a sadness and almost embarrassment when I think about this question of the, the environmental ecology because the truth is um, it sounds like an excuse, and I think sometimes it is an excuse, but also many times it's not that the, the reality in, in the country like Thailand and actually many other nations in Southeast Asia, um, the immediate problem or issue, I wouldn't say it's bigger, but it's very close to skin, which is the threat of dictatorship, freedom of expression, and many times it's really, you know, plain life-threatening um, situations happening daily in, in, in our country. So with this uh, surrounding you, I think it's very hard for people to think ecologically. It's not that we do not think about it. Actually, the, the arts people are one of the most active um, groups of people who are super aware of this. But when we want to make something happen, there's this question in front of us like, 
before we think green, how do we even make that happen in the first place, you know, with limited resources, with threatened freedom of expression? So it's like, it's like eco the environmental ecology is question number two for us. So, but of course, in practice, we are doing all the, 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 mm, the sm I, I don't know if I can say smaller actions, but of course, like reducing prints, you know, all these like uh, containers that are, would be used in, in the, in the festival or, or, um, production of, of actual physical objects that are not necessary, of course, we do reduce them and we just completely uh, discard them in, in many editions of Vipam, for example. And so it, it, is our, it is in the small, these smaller actions that we are uh, going forward with this like, um, you know, ecological thinking, but as a structural um, scheme forward, I, I would really say that we are still struggling to, to make that come true because you would have the second person asking you, why are you thinking of that while we have this, the guns, <laughs> really, the officials right next to your door. So yeah, so that's kind of where we are now. So I'm, I feel a bit torn when we have this question. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to go last, but I have this burning urge to, to, to you know, it running in my mind, so I just put it out there. But I mean, I think we can go back to that and I'll, I'll, I'll step back a little bit because I mentioned Cindy Huang uh, a little earlier. We had her on the panel yesterday and she was mentioning that the, she's a programmer in, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Arab countries and uh, Arab uh, or, or Muslim uh, Asian countries. And she says, there are cultural aspects that I have to keep in, 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 that I have to keep into account. There are things that are not moving in the same direction or in the same way as they would around the world. So when you talk about the colonialism, they might have a completely different perspective on what that means and what it means to bring forth uh, an interest in, 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 in first of all, in, in live arts, in, in arts in general, in, in performing arts, but also how they define themselves, how they have lost contact with how they define themselves because of said colonialism. So I'd love to hear, I, I'm really interested in saying, in, in, in seeing how, for example, you, you talk about cultural diplomacy and how is cultural diplomacy a tool in making sure that we address as many people as possible and making sure that we hear as many uh, people as possible and we make sure in this case that we create new publics for these work because we want to share as much as possible that's what we that's why we do art we don't do art for aesthetic reason just for you know a, an elite few we want to be in touch with as many people as possible to create this 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 core of understanding and values how is cultural diplomacy uh, the, the, the cultural diplomacy that you describe something that brings us forward in that in that case. I wouldn't normally talk about John F. Kennedy, but I, I I will today because we have just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy Center, which opened its doors in 1971. And one of the things that we did was to create a new exhibition on JFK to point out the connection between. Um, his his presidency, his administration, his particular passions and 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 movements in in the work that he did with the Kennedy Center, which is the National Center for the for the Performing Arts. And one of the things that that he did was to use cultural diplomacy as a as a tool um, during the during the Cold War uh, to bring artists into the to the White House, such as a Pablo uh, Pablo Casals, which was during the time of Franco, and Casals had said that he would no longer perform. But because of Kennedy, he agreed to do this performance, and that was to raise awareness of what was going on in the in the world um, and in Spain with with Franco. And I think that um, another thing that 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 he did was to bring the Mona Lisa for the first time to the United to the United States, working with the French president at that time to make that that happen. <clears throat> it 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 inspires people. It 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 brings to it brings people together. And I think that it is it is very important that we um, that we that we do this. My work has consisted of <clears throat> sorry of doing um, international festivals over, over the last uh, couple of decades where I have looked around the world to Africa, to Latin America, to Asia, um, 
including China, India, the 22 countries of the Arab world, um, the, the Nordic countries, um, Russia, um, France, Germany, England. Um, and we have presented what has been of interest to me is to put on our stages that which reflects contemporary society as a way of debunking um, stereotypes that might exist um, and that usually exist for, for certain of the, the countries that I was uh, presenting. So that became a very important um, thing for me to do. And what I think is so important is that we educate people about other people. And that's what those uh, festivals serve to, to do. Washington is a microcosm of the, of the United States. It is an international city, in part because of all of the, the embassies that are, are, are based there, but also because of the, 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 the migrant and immigrant communities that are, are based there. We are a quasi-government institution, so we have a congressional mandate to put on our stages that which reflects the culture of the people of the United States. And since we are a nation of immigrants, both willing and unwilling, it means that we can look around to the world to make those connections. And that has been a part of my, my mandate in terms of the work that I have done over these uh, years. Of course, the United States is the most multicultural country in the, in the world, and we do have an obligation. And the Kennedy Center, when I first joined, was, was pretty Eurocentric um, in terms of the work that it's it presents, and we are having a, um, a time, I think, trying to balance the scales, if you will. So it's not just the, the, the symphony orchestra, it's not just the opera, it's not just the ballet, but there are other um, arts and, and culture that are equally, if not more, important. It used to be that they were referred to as um, the, the high arts and the low arts. Well, those terms no longer are, are used, um, but it still exists in terms of where resources are, are applied. And so it is with a great deal of energy that we work to try to create more, more balance and make sure that what we put on our stages is, is representative. I mean, that's the platform that I, that I have and, and the work that I'm able to, to do to try to, to create change. And I can't help uh, but make a link with a project that you have uh, about the rivers, uh, which in, in part will, will help reconnect with the uh, indigenous communities from around the, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Potomac River? Potomac, right. Potomac River. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How we, we we're bridging, work, right. in this case, the relationship with the ecology and with communities that are surrounding your... Right. Uh, what I have done in the past is really to focus geographically on the various countries, regions, on, on continents. And after all of this time, I decided that I wanted to do something that was more thematic. Um, and it turned out, I, I started thinking about this probably seven or eight years ago, this idea of using rivers as the lens by which to, to discuss or to talk about global arts and culture. All civilizations rose from the, uh, th those places where there were rivers, starting with the Tigris and the, and, the, and the Euphrates. And so I'm looking around the world as a way to um, bring to the, to the Kennedy Center that work in the performing arts, music, dance, theater, plus the visual arts, literature, film, fashion, and culinary arts to tell these uh, stories and to raise the awareness of what, and, and what rivers, rivers lead us to waters which lead to the environment which lead to climate change. So we are working with the UN, uh, we are one of the partners in uh, the World Water Day that happens on March 22nd. Uh, we will be very involved in that. As you know, COP27 is taking place right now in Cairo, so other of our partners are in Cairo at this, at this time, but really ex ex expanding that network uh, or that ecosystem that we're usually working with. And um, indeed, the indigenous peoples have been the, the keepers, the caretakers of the rivers. And to have this opportunity to focus on indigenous 
um, work, in, indigenous artists, is something that is very, very Im important to me. So have been talking to, to, to many of the uh, communities of indigenous, indigenous people around the world. Thank you. Uh, Franck, j'aimerais ça vous passer la parole maintenant parce que vous avez, par vous avez parlé tout à l'heure de l'importance de... Ben, en fait, quand vous organisez des concerts, musique du monde, ça veut dire se rendre aussi dans les communautés autochtones ou aller chercher tout le savoir qui est, qui est retiré de ces, de, de ces chansons-là. Puis je pense qu'on... Il y a un moment où est-ce qu'on a repensé notre manière d'aller chercher ces musiques-là, de les... Euh, comment je dirais, de demander la permission dans une perspective où est-ce qu'on change l'idée d'aller extraire ces savoirs-là, mais plutôt d'aller euh, demander si on peut les partager, si on peut les... Et de quelle manière est-ce que ça, ça a changé la, la manière de fonctionner? Euh... Ça n'a pas changé la manière de fonctionner du tout. D'accord. Parce que, en fait, c'est une question fondamentale que vous posez là. Qu'est-ce qu'on va chercher? Comment on va le chercher? Qu'est-ce qu'on va prendre et qu'est-ce qu'on redonne? C'est une question qui, qui est au cœur de mon... Vraiment au cœur de mes... De mes de mes, comment dirais-je, de mes préoccupations dans ce travail qui, qui est un travail passionnant parce que ça veut dire vraiment vivre avec les communautés. Je voudrais juste citer ceci en réponse peut-être avec tout ce qui a été dit. Ça, ça vient de Sitin Bull, le chef d'Akota et en médecine aussi, qui dit, on, on connaît cette, cette phrase, mais je trouve que c'est important de la rappeler, quand le dernier arbre sera abattu, la dernière rivière empoisonnée, le dernier poisson capturé, alors le visage pâle réalisera que l'argent ne se mange pas. Voilà, c'est un petit peu ça. C'est-à-dire qu'en réalité, euh, quand on part euh, à la rencontre de ces communautés, on prend du temps. On prend du temps pour le faire. Et euh, ces, ces enregistrements que l'on fait, ils sont avec l'acceptation. de ces. On, on, ça, c'est une, une démarche de travail qui, qui, qui est vraiment, pour moi, euh, essentielle. C'est-à-dire, c'est la manière, l'esprit dans lequel on fait tout ça. On est un esprit partagé de consentement mutuel qui se pose d'une acceptation. En Nouvelle-Calédonie, il y a cette, cette coutume qui fait qu'on se présente et, et, et on explique pourquoi on vient et l'autre vous reçoit et vous accueille et se présente également. Voilà. C'est comme ça que ces musiques traditionnelles, en tout cas sur ce travail de collectage de terrain, euh, sont réalisées en ce qui concerne mon équipe et moi-même. Et pour revenir un peu à ce que Sassapine disait sur, le, sur la situation de certains pays, c'est vrai que... Euh, il y a l'écosystème qui, 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 qui rend aussi aujourd'hui les choses et la politique qui va avec, évidemment, qui rend les choses extrêmement difficiles pour les circulations des artistes. J'avais engagé, enfin, engagé un musicien iranien qui n'a pas pu venir parce qu'il ne peut pas sortir de son pays. Je veux dire, ça, c'est des vraies questions aujourd'hui qu'on se pose. Moi, dans les perspectives à venir, je, je, autant ma, ma, comment ma, ma position, mon travail reste quelque chose de très, de très ouvert, de très optimiste, de très riche, parce que les, les relations existent. Et ce que je disais tout à l'heure dans ces musiques dites traditionnelles, des musiques de la tradition orale, qui passent par l'humain, qui passent par la nature et par ces re relations indissociables, c'est vivant, c'est extrêmement vivant et on est dans une cosmogonie et on est dans, la, dans du quantique, c'est-à-dire dans, dans un tout et dans les populations autochtones comme dans les populations euh, de nombreuses communautés du monde, là, il n'y a pas de différence entre la nature et l'homme. L'homme, tout est en l'homme et tout est dans la nature, donc c'est une communion permanente. Mais aujourd'hui, moi, les perspectives euh, de, de la radio, des, 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 de la circulation des artistes, c'est une vraie question. Il y a plein d'artistes qu'on ne peut pas engager parce qu'ils sont dans des situations politiques impossibles, extrêmement dangereuses. Et, et, et ça, c'est une, une, vraie, une vraie problématique. Voilà, pas, pas, dans l'immédiat, je n'ai pas de réponse parce qu'on est en train de le vivre pleinement. On est au cœur de tout ça et on essaye de trouver des réponses au fur et à mesure. Je pense, Sassipin, et je vais back à vous, et vous avez mentionné que les priorités ne peuvent pas être les mêmes dépendant de la situation, situation de la politique dans votre pays, et vous parlez de la jeunesse, même si elles sont sous des menaces constantes, parce que le environnement politique est tense, elles ont encore beaucoup d'espoir, elles sont encore en train de marcher. Et si nous le prenons, We, we branch it out to communities. How do you interact with communities in this kind of setting to make sure that, is it a priority? Is it possible to still keep that as a priority to be a connector between these different communities, these different interests, even under this, uh, this tense situation? Is it a bonus to be able to connect with these communities or it's something that you have to work extra hard as at because of the uh, tense situation? Uh, the, the thing that we constantly do is to balance this position, this position, actually precisely that question that how do we continue to connect while uh, keeping 
ourselves and our friends in the community safe and and also continue to to go forward so um i'm thinking many things it's it's like it's like there are things that for example the government in thailand would find um as as threats and non-threats so something like international work um networking making festivals art without inquiring in depth what art really means these belong to the category of okay like green light stuff but when you dive deeper into what artists are actually doing in their arts and um for for better or for worse the performing arts are still pretty much under the radar so there there are there's this pros and cons that what the artists are doing um mostly they can get away with it because they are not in the mass you know they are not on so much on the surface so so artists can really continue to critique although in ways that they have to find um how to make it safe for example how to promote it how to not put certain words or cer- mention certain incidents even though that is the very core of the work that they're doing in their you know description of the work for example so there's always this like you know push and pull play for for us and for the artists too that how do we continue to push the boundaries and ask questions but then keep keeping yourself safe and um we are struggling with this question now like what where, where is the line of censorship where where do you start uh, realizing that this is self censorship is it okay to self censor um should we be worried if we are self censoring or not because in m- many times actually it's been it's been um a practice of many artists of many great artists that i know that because they practice self censoring in the way that it has become their artistic practice that they could continue to work for so long and making such you know n- numerous great works so um but but as the society moved forwards like i said you know with the youth movement that really came in 2020 artists are also questioning themselves like now that the doors are pushed kicked open i would even say like you know punched open the roof the ceiling has been broken we can ask more question now but of course it doesn't mean that you can just ask you get consequences asking questions but there are more stronger forces and and willingness to ask the questions the artists who have practiced self censorship now they're also re-questioning like do i still have to self censor and how much do i speak how in which way do i ask um and again in order to to keep yourself safe and the the question of safety in thailand is also quite interesting because it's very arbitrary like you could be this today uh, completely safe completely fine far away from all the official threats next day you can be thrown in jail for who knows what you don't really know and they're going to find a reason to throw you in jail if they would really like to so it's there's not really a a concrete um you know rule of law that you can refer to and then hey this the law says this so i should be fine it doesn't really work like that in a country like that you just you know if they decide to do that you they'll find a reason and a way to um to make it happen so so that's 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 i would say that's the realm of uh, tides of uncertainty that we are gliding in between um so yeah so for with this uh, frame of thought uh, charles i would say that we are standing by with the artists and um when we have resources from from international communities we we bring them to the artists in hope that they it can help them maybe figure out something or you know see some examples not to say that they have to follow them but you know just give ideas um for example connecting we were just in conversation with um a, a collective called artists at risk connections uh, they are in good good friends with the Mekong Cultural Hub and they have you know produced a guideline f- for for this for our for artists to be safe in in this new world or era digitally and also physically for example so we also try to find for the artists of course the artists are trying to survive on their own but now that we are connectors of other cultures and examples from around the world we can bringing these resources and ideas to to help artists tackle um whatever they are tackling yeah thank you uh, martin je 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 lancerai la question suivante uh, parce que ça m'amène à cette réflexion là de tout ce que j'ai entendu on est dans un monde extrêmement polarisé 
euh, et chaque pays polarise d'une manière un peu différente. Et on sent qu'il y a une génération, il y a un grand euh, changement, on va dire, dans la manière d'aborder les arts dans une génération plus jeune, dans les, ceux qui prennent la place en ce moment. Donc, on parle de décolonialisme, on parle de, 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 de repenser les genres, on pense à l'inclusion, euh, mais comme les différents endroits où on va aller chercher des artistes sont souvent polarisés. Comment est-ce qu'on s'assure que ces artistes-là qui vont vouloir aborder des enjeux qui parfois sont des enjeux qui euh, pourraient rendre inconfortables les, 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 les pays d'où ils viennent, on s'assure qu'ils gardent, une, ils, ils restent en sécurité? Ou de quelle manière? Est-ce qu'on sent ici, euh, et sans vouloir pointer le Canada, mais dans, dans le pays où, dans lequel on est, où est-ce qu'on se considère très libéral, on se considère très ouvert d'esprit, de quelle manière est-ce que ces artistes-là sont accueillis et on s'assure, on est sûr que peu importe ce qu'ils vont avoir à, 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 à aborder, ça va être bien reçu. That's a great question, I, and I think we can never be absolutely sure. Before I go into that, can I just mention? Yes. <laughs> um, in in response to what Françoise said about um, how we use artistic and intellectual property that belongs to others, um, the Australian Council for the Arts has published a 200-page document uh, 15 years ago, a long time ago, that's called Protocols for Using First Nations Cultural and Intellectual Property in the Arts. It's 200 pages of exact, exact guidelines and exact information and exact help. Um, and everybody who applies for a grant at the Australian Council for the Arts needs to um, comply with those guidelines. As soon as you use, say, a Torres Strait Islander song in your work, you have to, you have to go through the protocols that are mentioned in this document. Um, just to say that, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We need, we need actual knowledge and we need actual information as to how to proceed and the good you know the good news is this information exists and you don't even need to walk up to a person and expose all of your ignorance to that person you can just go on the website of the Australian Council for the Arts for example um, and find that information there um, but yes to get back to your question um, I, I think what well no first thing First thing, when you say like, you know, we want to speak to as many people as possible or include as many people as possible, that's like the one of the dominant multicultural discourses in the arts at the moment. And I think what conceptually um, doesn't really work with that approach is that you as say a white arts leader person, um, it's almost like you were not part of the system. You can adopt a strategy in order to diversify your audiences and you know people will be happy um, or you can apply a strategy to diversify your program and people will be happy but the work that we need to do is work where you cannot expect that it won't change you yourself it will put you on the line it will put your way of thinking of yourself on the line and that in doing the work will change um, And that's sort of the only hope we have as white people, that we will learn things and do things differently. Um, and so part of what we try to do in order to create an appropriate environment for the many artists who come from specific cultural backgrounds, from specific countries and cities and from specific artistic practices. So it's really different from one to the other and there's no sort of one size fits all. What we we hope to do is create something that's almost structural trust like trust at an organizational level it would be sort of an easy way out to say you know oh i've known artist x for 10 years and i've been to his place so i know how things work like me personally and so we trust each other that's like the easy way out um that exists and that's not you know that's not useless that's something you can do and that's something you can you can cultivate but We need to do better than that. We need to create organizational structures that produce trust, that don't put people in dangerous or insecure positions. And and so I think there are many ways of doing that. And like I don't have the absolute answer at all, but like I think sharing leadership is one way of doing that. Like co-artistic leadership or having curating teams is one way of doing that. Because then you draw from different knowledges. Um, Yeah, I don't know, in, inviting curators from specific co communities to do something. Anything that decenters Western thought will help with creating that structural trust for artists who come from other communities. Um, yeah, 
I, I don't know. That's just the beginning of maybe an, an answer. Oh, no, no, no. It's it, it gives a lot of uh, it gives a it gives a lot us a lot to, to think about, and it's it's really interesting because uh, I get the sense that we're talking about the uh, hierarchy. Uh, I'm gonna de hierarchisation. <laughs> so I don't know how the interpreters uh, went with that one, but it's it sounds really good in French. I hope it sounded as as good in 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 English. De hi, pardon me. Thank you very much. The hierarchy. There we go. Let, let's keep it simple. There's a sense of the hierarchy, making sure that we collect uh, leadership from a lot of people around us and share that leadership as widely as possible. And it might not be possible everywhere. You know, it's 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 fun to know that we are privileged if we manage to be able to do something like that. Uh, um, I'd love to open the floor for questions or thoughts, but before I do that, I wanted to know if if there were any lights uh, last thoughts that you wanted to add in before we move on to the questions. Oh yes. <laughs> We already have people picking up the mics. No, I, I, just to respond to, to Martin, I, <clears throat> I agree with um, a, a lot of what you are, 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 are saying about decolonization and about how people are, or how people need to, to behave or, or deal with people of other, other races, other, other cultures. Um, I think that it is, it is not just white people that can not do the right thing. Uh, it's people of color. I think we all have to figure out what, how it can be more organic, how we can um, be more more engaged, and how to be able <clears throat> to to create the architecture, the scaffolding by which they can not just be a, a transactional occurrence, but can be engaged and can then also be a part of the the organization, the thinking, and and participate at at every level. And that's that's something that is it has been very difficult for me to to make happen at the at the Kennedy Center, uh, which is a huge organization. So I'm constantly thinking about that in ways in which to to make it better. Yeah. Also relating to that, Nona, continuing to Martin's point, um, I colonialism makes me also think that there are other uh, dimensions also, especially uh, within what we know. As Asia, you know, there's not just the West and the East. There's really other layers of colonialism, and what we at BIPAM are dealing with um, when we talk to partners, we are aware that there are sources of authority, not just the Western world, but also the the North Asian countries, for example. And this this is with great respect to all my my friends and partners who are here from the North. Um, Asian countries, but I, I I love that we could now talk about it. I wasn't sure we could, but now that the conversation has started, um, you know, it's we have to be just just to accept the fact that there is authority of of you know what financial authority and also what is norm you know in in the arts world in Asia too. And for a, a Southeast Asian country like Thailand to to be able to do something to make something happen, of course we we rely on resources from the northern asian countries and we we have to be also aware of these like a power you know overlays and a power play within within these um projects and collaborations but i would also say that but we can do that by not being you know um arrogantly rejecting this this power but really sit down together with the partners and you know be be on par and and really get literal about what partners mean, you know, not just someone who provides resources, but when you want to partner with someone, Southeast Asian and North Asian countries, you sit down and you really go through these, you know, the 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 hard questions together and make sure that they are there on the table before we begin to 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 move forward with our collaboration and I'm I'm just super grateful that for my own experience so far collaborating with all my you know North Asian countries we have been successful in at least personally getting these uh, conversations on the table and start really from there before we go on other steps yeah thank you uh, any last words before we move on to it? Uh, because there's a lot that we're unpacking here and it's really quite rich and, and interesting. 
All right, let's 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 see what we get from the floor now. Uh, there are mics that will be going around. Do we have someone uh, on mic? Yes, we've got someone on mic right there. So just raise your hand if you want to uh, to ask a question or even to inter uh, to 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 pass a comment because I'm sure that some of the issues we've talked about are issues that you've had to deal with in your respective organizations. So it'd be it'd be lovely to hear your. Uh, your thoughts and voices on, on, on this situation. Et bien entendu, vous pouvez poser des questions en français ou en anglais, parce que reste quand même qu'il y aura d'interprétation. Si vous parlez dans le micro, on pourra euh, bien comprendre euh, ce que vous dites. Et je vous, euh, je vous invite aussi à vous présenter avant de poser la question, de faire votre commentaire. I, I, like to invite you to present yourself to, so we know where you're coming from uh, when you'll be asking questions or uh, interjecting. Ah! Je sens comme euh, une hésitation. There's a, there's a slight hesitation. I thought it was a very rich uh, and thought-provoking uh, panel. I don't know if people are still just digesting what we went through or if they are just uh, <laughs> shy to ask a question. But please don't be. Don't, don't hesitate. Uh, pick up the mic. Or if, if only to, uh, to clarify whatever was said. And, and yes, we have a question right over there. And then we'll have another one at the back there. So let's start over here. Thank you. My name is Mikkel Harder. I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. I think one of the problems in having a more fair ecosystem of the arts is the financial structures behind our organizations. Because very often a success is measured in number of sold tickets or income and not values or the quality of the art or the impact. So how do we create uh, financial structures, mainly up, up around the bigger institutions, the national institutions, that uh, will encourage us to have a more value-based uh, um, accounts, so to say? It's an interesting question, and it's something that was brought up in one of the panels yesterday is uh, how do we get out of a transactional perspective when we talk about arts, whether it's about touring or whether it's about how you address your public and how you get in touch with your publics. Can we get out of a perspective that's purely transactional and go into what do we do art from the get-go? Who do we want to reach out to? What kind of changes do we want to see in society? I think we had a question at the back there. Uh, if you could raise your hand again. Si vous pouviez lever la main encore. Oui, on avait une question juste en arrière, puis après ça, j'en ai une autre un, un petit peu plus loin en arrière. Mais monsieur ici dans le... Re, re, levez votre main pour qu'on puisse... Euh, oui. Bonjour. Euh, Pierre Igrobetti, je suis artiste. Et je travaille pour une compagnie de théâtre et de danse euh, en, au Luxembourg et en France. Euh, je me posais la question euh, s'il n'y avait pas des, une confrontation ou des courants de pensée qui sont un peu euh, inverses entre euh, l'idée que euh, l'être humain fait partie de la nature et du coup que c'est un tout et en même temps on parle de décolonialisme et en même temps ce serait à nous ici de déconstruire ou d'architecturer les choses pour qu'elles soient différentes et du coup du fait de vouloir faire ça nous-mêmes ici est-ce qu'on retombe pas dans le même mécanisme colonialiste ou euh, que l'être humain serait capable de réparer la nature Est-ce qu'on n'est de nouveau pas dans cette même façon de voir les choses et de penser euh, culturelle qui revient C'est une question intéressante. Euh, je, oui. Je... Alors, j'ai euh, une, une réponse qui va sonner comme un tout petit peu trop facile, mais je pense quand même qu'elle est vraie. Donc, je vous l'offre euh, comme ça. Je vous, vous l'offre même en français. Voilà. <rire> Alors, euh, je crois que ce que j'essaie de décrire dans euh, ce que Alicia nomme une architecture différente et ce que moi, je dis de la confiance structurelle, euh, ce n'est pas tellement quelque chose qui est à construire de zéro ou quelque chose qui serait à imposer. Il s'agit beaucoup plus, et ça c'est vraiment l'expérience que je fais dans le travail, euh, on va dire, antidiscriminatoire ou peut-être éventuellement décolonial euh, que nous faisons au FTA, puis aussi dans mon festival en Allemagne avant, c'est que 
le travail, c'est de remettre en question des idées préconçues. Le travail, c'est de déconstruire, en fait, beaucoup de choses qui nous ont été euh, apprises. Euh, et donc, c'est beaucoup plus un travail de défaire avant de pouvoir éventuellement reconstruire. Euh, donc, je, je crois que c'est ce questionnement-là. Qu'est-ce qu'on a imposé avant et souvent imposé en étant dans le déni, souvent imposé euh, en prétendant qu'on n'imposait pas, euh, imposé en prenant les avantages que ça nous donnait, comme personne blanche par exemple, mais en masquant le fait qu'il y ait oppression, qu'il y ait une structure qui déprivilégie les autres. Euh, donc il s'agit beaucoup plus de déconstruire ça que de tout de suite mettre autre chose à la place. Puis je, si je peux me permettre de rajouter aussi, il y a la question d'être de, de, conscient de biais cognitifs, de savoir que, ah oui, ben à cause d'une perspective unique, une perspective qui était qui, 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 qui est rendue étroite par, on va dire, dans ce cas-ci, le colonialisme ou une pensée qui est unique, ben de, le fait de le reconnaître nous fait prendre conscience qu'il y a d'autres facettes qu'on qu a arrêté de voir, qu'on a arrêté de reconnaître et qu'en ne regardant pas ces autres facettes-là, on crée des injustices jusqu'à un certain point. Puis, même chose pour l'impact sur l'environnement, l'idée n'est pas de dire je, comme j'ai le je suis celui qui a le pouvoir de transformer l'environnement pour régler tous les problèmes du monde, c'est au, au contraire de se dire, ben Malgré ma petitesse, malgré ma, 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 ma grande humilité et ma, ma, ma grande insignifiance, j'ai assez d'importance pour avoir un impact négatif sur l'environnement. Donc, par conséquent, peut-être que malgré mon insignifiance, je suis quand même capable d'avoir un impact positif aussi. Alors, reste à moi et aux gens qui m'entourent de voir de quelle manière est-ce qu'on peut s'assurer d'avoir des impacts positifs plutôt que des impacts no euh, négatifs, en étant conscient de notre place dans cet écosystème-là et en connaissant nos propres biais cognitifs. Euh, J'avais une autre question ici à l'arrière. Oui, oui, vous avez déjà le micro. Uh, pardon. <laughs> Bonjour. Uh, Bettina Savo. I'm uh, from Uruguay, but I'm based here in Montreal and Paris. Um, the, all of the comments have been like super interesting. And um, regarding the, like the one of the things that worries me quite a lot, uh, coming from South America, where yes, our priority is more like, do I bring bread to my table, than Can I not buy something that is going to be uh, sustainable as a reality? And I think that there's a, a situation about responsibility that we need to address in, in the room regarding it is mostly countries with power that have created the situation that we're at. And it's very easy to come to places that they don't have the resources and be like, you're using plastic. I mean, there's things that we need to talk about and of course, It is urgent. We need all to to work on it. Um, and but something that is important to mention is that it's not up to more powerful or countries with more money, let's say, to save the world or save the other people or like come and do just like one specific program that suddenly they inject lots of money. They come and they're like, oh, we did this great thing. Then they leave and the place is in, still in the same situation. So that's another way of colonialism, because it's also you're forcing them to adapt to the Western way of doing things, to the Western bureaucracy, to the Western grant application system and whatnot. So what about like going to places, opening your mind and years, especially the years, and learning about how people do in other places and what is really good about that and why it may not work. And then it's up to us, yes, the system and Institutions take way longer time to change, but if we don't communicate with them and we don't let them know that maybe in some other place things are being done in a great way, they're never going to know because they are, they are comfortable on their system. And the last thing I wanted to say about that is like, okay, how to empower those places, how to come and work together to create a sustainable structure then whoever comes, like it is uncomfortable for Like now I live here in Canada in a first quote unquote first world country. There's no second world country. I don't know if ever anyone noticed. There's no way to turn from a third world country to a first world country. There's n nobody talks about the second world. Anyways, but the, um, I lost my thought on that joke. <laughs> um, but yeah, about like bringing things like, yes. So it is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable to go to other places and to collaborate, and it takes more effort, but that effort is needed. 
and there's, sometimes there's more time, there's cultural differences, people showing up late, there's many things that are different. But that effort needs to be made, and I think that that, in a way, is, is that the way that people can take responsibility by taking into that patience, into really collaborating and trying to find a common ground. I think that's, those are very interesting thoughts and I'd, I'd love to hear it from you because we've got people of vision on this panel. On a des gens qui ont des visions extrêmement intéressantes sur ce panel-là. Et euh, en fait, une, une chose qui me vient en tête ici, ben c'est sûr qu'il y, y, y a plein de choses qui ont été, euh, qui ont été nommées sur comment est-ce que nos organisations dans les, les, les uh, in, in, I'm, I'm going to switch to English, I'm sorry. It's going to be easier since I heard it. I'm just letting the interpreters know, so it's <laughs> I'm not going to confuse them too much. Since we're in first world country, we invest in helping uh, 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 other countries. To what extent, as, as individuals in those organizations, do you make sure that the organization understand that we can't have a dominant, uh, subservient relationship in this helping relationship. That's the first thing. And second of all, uh, I remember talking about mutual, uh, mutualization with you, Sassipin, and uh, avec France uh, as well. Uh, how can mutualization be seen in a, for now, in the way that the world is shaped as a uh, vertical situation? That is, is mutualization possible in a vertical way? if we consider the shape of the world right now where there are first world countries and then second and third world countries. Is that is that a possibility? How can we reach that to make sure that you, you ha we create a new balance, a new uh, uh, balance in, in how we interact? Mm. Well, I, th I think that's what we all are trying to, to do, but you're coming up against a almost a brick wall. It's, it is very, very difficult. But to the, to the woman that was, uh, I think, from, from Uruguay, I just will tell this, um, this story. I, I did a festival called Americartes, which was an initiative over a four-year period of, of time where we looked at all of the countries in the, in, the, in the region. And so for the first year, there was a big, big opening, and I'd say it was um, Mexico, Colombia, um, Bra Brazil, and, and Peru. And so we did all of our marketing and advertising around those countries with, you know, using the, the flags. The next year, we did a different set of countries, but we had the, the invitations and a lot of advertising and marketing materials left over from the first year. And so the, I said, so we have to, to redo this, we have to, to change it. Because one of the things that can happen is a big organization can undermine all of your intentions of trying to, to heal and bring people together and to share, share culture. So they, they said, no, we don't need to, to, to change this because it was just um, you know, sort of amorphous looking, but the colors were the, the colors, you know. They said, nobody will know. I said, You will not know, but they will know. And we must not do this. So I won. We made them with the countries that we were representing. But it's that kind of thing that is, is, is very difficult to, to deal with. So part of the, the work that I do has to be around educating the, um, the, the team of people that are, I'm going to be working with. And I always bring in, um, you know, graphic designers and others from the countries that I'm working with, so that we can have it as authentic as 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 possible in terms of the of the representation. So, um, I would add from the perspective of this third world country or <laughs> the the other side of the power. Um, I think one of the ways to be more Uh, on par with each other, whether it's horizontal or vertical, as you said, is to to recognize that everybody has our you we all have our own shit really, and and to be arrogant about the shit that you have is is arrogance and it's not helping this this mutualization or equalization. So as a um, someone from a third world country, again, I mean we we have our shit, but then it's not 
it's not my my job or my position to go on tell the world that my shit is the most important one and more important than the ones that the white people have. No, um, so so I think we can try to be culturally uh, leveled by by recognizing each other's shit really and and not to to be aggressive about you know my shit is bigger and so that's why you have to listen to mine and like your shit doesn't matter. Yeah, this is I think this is really what's happening in many places that the conversation sometimes underneath it all is about who shit is better or bigger or more important. And the truth is that we all have our cultural, political, financial shit and um, be a little more empathetic I think with, with each other about this and maybe the, you know, the boundaries of the white and the west and the east and the south and the north maybe would, it, it is it is there. I'm not, to, not, not here to say that we should forget all these uh, labels because they are there for a reason. They have been coined for a reason, but also to know that they are not the only frames from which we can look at things. And because in the end, it's very easy to go into this like self-victimization kind of position. And that is not in any way a healthy place to start any kind of communication or collaboration. Yeah. That, that was very generous of you to say. Because some people have historically been responsible for other people's shit, but, but also I hear you and, and I think, you know, we've known each other for a long time and so we do move forward together. Um, but also in response to what Bettina Sabo said, which I think is absolutely true and, um, and very, well, um, very well said also. Um, of course, no, actually I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, in 2012, uh, in Germany, the Federal Cultural Foundation, Kulturstiftung des Bundes, decided to set up money for collaborations between Germany and different African countries, all of the continent. So artists and arts institutions could apply for funding for projects that they would do together. It was a huge sum of money, and that fund ran from 2012 to 2021. And over 100 projects have been funded with what is very often a really large sum for independent arts organizations or small companies who would apply for that funding. So say it would be, it would be like 50,000 euros for a project that costs maybe 70,000. Um, so like this was substantial. Um, and of course, each of these projects ran into the same difficulties it ran into the difficulty of a complete imbalance of power, financial means, you mentioned it, um, power of defining what art is, um, where art takes place, who it addresses, um, what the artistic canon is, um, what pre preconceptions there are, all of that. And you know, and people sort of struggled through it and they did their best. Like they, they had consultations and they worked on their racism issues and, and a whole country, like a whole arts ecosystem, was going through it. And, and obviously people got better. And the rhetoric changed. That was one you know, visible change. And, and I'm not saying rhetoric is nothing. Rhetoric is something. The way you talk about things is something. Um, but also, like looking back on those 10 years, you realize that it may be an excessive demand to make on a small arts organization to rebalance dual political power issues. It's not going to happen at that level. And we need to address it at a different level also. Indeed. Uh, quite, yes. I think we, had, we have someone with the mic over there, and then we'll move to the front right over here. Hi, I'm Cindy Huang. I'm glad the student was in the class when the professor called my name. Um, I wanted to address the challenge, the gentleman's question from Denmark about you know the structures. I think... Like I said yesterday, it really all comes down to keeping your mind open. I kept, I said yesterday, we're in a creative industry. Why are we limiting ourselves by allowing these boundaries and shit tell us how we do our job? You know, Sazapan comes from, has her own set of issues. You know, Alicia comes from her own set of challenges, but we still have to get the work done. And I think I challenge everyone again is that, don't let those boundaries stop you from doing what you need to do. It's all about finding creative solutions. 
otherwise we're not in the creative industries. You know, we are, otherwise we would all be scientists and mathematicians that has to use certain specific formulas. If people can find ways to evade tax, taxes, I'm sure we can find ways to solve our problems, really. Um, and also sort of adding on to what Sassapan was saying about this comparison of like who has more shit. It's also just we like to point fingers as an industry is what I've observed. We like to say this person is not giving me enough money. This person is saying this and this. It's always other people's fault that we can't do our job but never really looking at ourselves. And that's also something that I really wanted to challenge everyone is to w across all sectors really look at yourself carefully and say what am I doing you know, what am I doing wrong or what am I doing that I can do better? Rather than saying it's other people's fault. So we're always, you know, that's why we end up having this comparison of who's, whose problem is bigger and whose problem is supposedly, you know, more important than others. Thank you. And it's also important to, uh, it, we are talking about changes. We are talking about how you know, the, old, the whole ecosystem is changing right now, so no better time but to have self-reflection -ref as well. We're changing our ways of working, rethinking the chain of, you know, uh, of interactions. Now's a good time to see how do I fit into that chain and how can I be a stronger link within that cha uh, chain. Thank you very much. We had a question at the front right here. And then this will be the last question because we're, we're going to get pushed out by the next panel. <laughs> and I would hate Hi. to take up all their time. Thank you. Hi, Laura Colby. I'm the founder and president of LC Management. We are located on Lenape land in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and I really appreciate this panel today and this discussion in this room on this incredibly global international level. Um, I get as a white woman that my privilege is firmly based on centuries of white supremacy and colonialism in my country. I have, I have the honor and privilege of representing a roster of artists from around the planet, many of whom are people of color and I proceed and tread carefully in my work for them with my privilege in place as it is. Um, I also speak to you from a country that is grappling with this experiment, otherwise known as democracy. And today we are on a precipice of God only knows what, and hopefully we'll have an answer for you in four weeks, but hang in there, people. <laughs> it's, it's a rough ride, this one. I just wanted to stand up and say thank you to Sonars for carefully selecting these speakers today. Um, I love the representation is not the same old, same old, and this is not an even play, playing field. It has never been an even playing field for any of us, especially the artists. The artists are functioning in my country at a below poverty level. They make their work strictly from passion and guts and that's the only way work gets made in my country. And yes, there's a gigantic hierarchy and power structure, and many of us are doing our best to work that system, make it support our artists, and this incredible global inter intersection and conversation we're all having with, with this distribution of work that we do back and forth, those of us working over global boundaries and and huge, gigantic oceans. We have so many questions at our desks every day now, but thank you for digging into this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for this intervention. And, well, I guess we'll take one, yeah, we we're a little bit short for time. We'll, we'll, we'll pass you the mic, but we'll, it will have to be short because we're gonna get uh, pushed out in just a moment. Can so I yeah, so uh, right at the back, right there. Can I just hijack the microphone for a second? Yes, please. As a Latin American, I'm from Ecuador. I run a translation studio for the arts industry, and I would like to invite you to include Latin American voices in the panel, because we're in the same continent. How come we're not having a conversation? Very uh, good point. There's a great saying that says, it all starts with a conversation. Yes, so thank include, you. And include us, please. Yes, yes. Merci. Euh, Caroline Belgique, je suis comédienne et euh, je voulais juste euh, faire une réflexion, enfin, nous ramener à quelque chose d'intime et de profondément écologique. Quelque chose qui nous unit tous, c'est le, le corps. Euh, le corps, ben, le corps, c'est un, un outil dont on dispose tous les jours, mais qui est euh, composé de poussière d'étoiles. 
euh, et ça c'est n'est pas, pas une vision poétique, c'est scientifiquement prouvé, on est composé des mêmes atomes que ceux qui existent dans le soleil. Et je dis ça parce que je pense qu'à partir du moment où tu te connectes à ton sang, à ton cœur qui bat, à tes os, à ta peau, à l'eau qui existe dans ton corps, tu ne peux que sentir que, que rien n'est séparé, ni, ni toi par rapport aux autres, par rapport aux animaux, par rapport, par rapport aux plantes. Et euh, je, je pense que... On l'oublie trop souvent, en fait, ce corps, enfin, cette chose avec laquelle on, on arrive sur Terre et, et que l'on quitte euh, le jour de la mort. Voilà. Je ben pense merci. Que... merci beaucoup voilà. pour cette dernière intervention. C'est vrai que c'est le fun de se souvenir qu'effectivement, à la base, on est tous humains, n'est-ce pas? On est tous on l'oublie trop souvent, je pense. Et c'est juste dommage, des fois, qu'il y ait des, euh, des systèmes qui soient mis en place. It's... It's really too bad sometimes that we put systems in place that do not recognize that and create these inequalities. But it's fun to get back to the basic and remember that we're all living, breathing, wonderful people and that we hope that we all get a chance to share with one another on a level playing field. Uh, je, vous redis, je vous redis un gros merci. Thank you, Tiawank. Uh, et merci aux panélistes, surtout un très grand merci aux panélistes. Thank you very much. Thank you for being so generous.